as I follow in my father's footsteps from the beaches of Normandy to victory in Germany, this story will share not only the experiences of my father, but also the experiences of some of the men that he served with. As the 557th Field Artillery fought to free Western Europe from Adolf Hitler's Nazi rule. Not knowing where we were going, but we landed at Utah Beach. First, we were walking in the ocean, and we had our feet put on a little raft, pushed over onto the to where the land was. What did you see? There were uh, German hand grenades laying around and some rifles and. And you should see everything that was shot up and everything, but we got on. My father, 26 years old, survived the depression, bought his first home, had his first child, and then... I get a car. Greetings. I read it and I complained about it. And they said, well, son, where you live, there's not many people and we have to take whatever we can get. My father talked to his mother about joining the Merchant Marines. After much discussion on the matter, his mother said, The good Lord has already planned your life out for you. Don't make any changes. Went to Columbus, took a test. I was very fortunate to have a good score. And they picked six of us to go somewhere, they said. But we eventually became Oklahoma. And we thought we were going to go where we had to use our brain or something. But, uh, here I saw a statue of a huge infantryman. I said, oh my. Richard, can you tell me about your early beginnings? Were you enlisted or did you get drafted or what was the beginning like for you? Uh, I was drafted and then later on I was shipped to Fort Devens. Now, I wanted to ask you, um, after um, you were training in that, how was it that you found yourself in the field artillery? Well, when I f report to Fort Devens, they just loaded, uh, I don't know how many men on a troop train, and we went to Oklahoma. Harvey Chapdelaine of Northboro, Massachusetts, was drafted into the military right out of high school. His older brother, Arthur, also served, fighting in North Africa and Italy during the war. Chapdelaine would become a radio operator in the headquarters battery and would rise to the rank of corporal. Despite engaging in frequent battles with the Germans, Chapdelaine was unfazed by combat. Harvey Chapdelaine. It was just a big adventure for a kid my age. At 19 years old, it was just a big adventure. To a new outfit. And it was one of the first six inch long tom guns. With the stress placed on speed and mobility during World War II, it became necessary to remodel some of the weapons of the heavy artillery. And it was about 15, 20 feet long. It was one of the first guns, big guns like that, put on a tank. So it was flexible enough to go forward and come back and things like that. Well, most artillery pieces are drawn behind a vehicle, but this one, the, tank, the gun was mounted right on a Sherman tank. Oh, is that right? And that defines the self-propulsion? Yes. Oh my goodness. And that was, uh, what millimeter was that? 155. The shell weighed 95 pounds and it had a range of 10 miles. That's about what I can say about it. We have a picture there and it was beautiful. We had another tank behind us carried the ammunition. After landing on Utah Beach, the 557th Field Artillery moved on to fight in the Battle for Brest. Although not well known, the Battle for Brest was one of the most bitterly fought campaigns of World War II. The opposing forces in the Brest area were commanded by 56-year-old Lieutenant General Herman Bernard Rompke. 
He was a professional soldier. He was also a lifelong Nazi, supporting the cause right up to his death in 1968. Army Corps of Intelligence estimated that Ramke commanded between 35 to 40,000 troops. Many of these men were elite paratroopers, a group of ruthless, fearless, fanatical youth, the very manifestation of true Nazism. Adolf Hitler's orders to Ramke in the defense of Brest were simple, fight to the last man. Well, that was hedgerow country. I don't know if you're familiar with hedgerow country. The, uh, the fields were, uh, when they cleared the fields, they put all the rocks and debris in, in rows along the roads, and then they, there were shrubs grew on top. And it, it was fierce that the tanks had an awful hard time getting through that. Harvey Chapdelaine. You weren't going to shoot through. It was an ideal place for snipers. On August 21, 1944, the 557th Field Artillery arrived at their first firing position, one mile south of Coat Mill. On August 23, 13 months and 27 days after their formation, the 557th Field Artillery fired their first rounds in combat. Battery B, gun section number one, had the distinction of firing that first round toward Keistel two and a half miles northwest of Brest. On Friday, August 25th, Lieutenant Joseph Priest, radio operator Tech 5 William Hope, and driver Private First Class Maxwell Nutting, all of Battery B, went on a mission in Hedgerow Country to establish an observation post to conduct artillery fire. Suddenly, from behind a hedgerow, they encountered sniper fire. The first shot went right through the windshield instantly killing Tech 5 William Hope. The second shot hit Lieutenant Priest, knocking him out of the Jeep. Private First Class Nutting, under continual small arms fire, succeeded in getting Lieutenant Priest back into the Jeep and away from enemy fire. Radio operator Harvey Chapdelaine of Headquarters Battery listened to the skirmish on his radio. That boy should have gotten the Silver Star for saving that officer's life. Tech 5, William Hope, would become the 557th Field Artillery's first fatal casualty of the war. When most replacements join an outfit, they're wild-eyed, green, and scared. When Private First Class Casimir Pesta of Cleveland, Ohio joined the 557th Field Artillery, he had D-Day on his papers. Pesta would fight in five major campaigns during World War II. Normandy, Northern France, the Ardennes, the Rhineland, and Central Europe. After joining up with the 557th Field Artillery, he became a cannoneer and was also qualified as a sharpshooter on an M1 carbine. He would be assigned to Battery A. Private First Class Casimir Pesta on his first day in France, June 6th, 1944. When I landed on Utah Beach, I got off my boat onto a makeshift dock. As I walked down the dock to the beach, I was told not to look to my right. Well, I looked. The beach was piled with dead bodies. The area was secured, but still not safe. A German sniper took a shot at me. I felt the bullet pass right under my nose. On my second day, I was comforting some young kid that had just landed. <laughs> I felt like a veteran with just one day experience. Another time we went forward to shoot some pillboxes where the Germans were. We fired there for about two hours, blew up all the pillboxes. And we were ready to leave, and nearby there was a force. When we were getting ready to leave, holy hell broke out. Shells were coming all over from the woods. The Germans weren't in the pillboxes, they were in that woods. And so we had to turn around and go back. And our, our major, he was a major that was doing this, jumped in his Jeep with his driver, and says, I'll meet you down the road a couple of miles. You bring the outfit down. Well, we were getting shot up, 
and I had about, I was riding people with about 12, about 12 guys in the Jeep hanging on, and we took off and left the equipment there. In the meantime, the Germans left, but we were able to go back and get our equipment. Private First Class, Kazmer Pesta, on how the 557th would knock out a pillbox. We would hit the pillbox with naval armor-piercing shells. The naval apps would stick when they hit, and when they exploded would create a huge concussion inside. Due to the concussion, the Germans inside the pillbox would run out into the open. The naval apps would be followed up with white phosphor shells. The phosphorus would burn right through the exposed soldiers. On September 3rd, Battery B fired on enemy pillboxes in a German coastal fortress southwest of Plumergy. Amidst the hedgerows, fragments from a German 88 landed right in front of his gun, instantly killing Captain Hamilton Glover and critically wounding Sergeant Gilbert Welcher. Sergeant James Duff and Richard Kiesling also received wounds from the blast. Richard Kiesling. Fortifications there that we took this one gun up behind the hedgerow and we could aim right down at the pillboxes. Well, we fired one round and the Germans fired one over, one shot, and the next one we didn't hear. And it hit right in front of the captain who was on a scope and he was killed. On September 5th, the battalion moved to a new firing position in the fields near Trezeguet, northeast of St. Renan and due west of Milizak. With Captain Ricketts now in charge, Battery B fired the registration rounds for the rest of the battalion. So one day I had to go on a mission, and I had to go by myself, about 10, 15 miles from where we were, and I got lost. And I couldn't get back to camp because it got dark. I pitched a tent, cooked something. We always carried food. In the morning, I woke up, got in a jeep, and I went up a road, not knowing where I was going. And pretty soon, about a couple of miles later, I run into Germans laying on a, along the road, guns laying there. They saw me going, they saw that I got scared. And as I was trying to turn around a small air, they were laughing about it. But they had surrendered that morning, me not knowing it. And I took off. And I finally found the outfit, my outfit. One day, Private First Class Kazmer Pesta and the men of Battery A found a box of German paratrooper knives. The men decided to split the box of knives among themselves and they all ended up with a war souvenir. For Private First Class Pesta, it was not his first souvenir of the war. Shortly after joining up with the 557th Field Artillery, I found a pair of German combat boots. I had my first war souvenir. When I looked inside the boots, the soldiers' feet were still in them. A vital part of the Allied war effort was the resistance the Maquis, more commonly known as the French Underground. This is the story of one of them. Since the war began, I had never really confronted the enemy until the day I was beaten up for no reason by a group of Germans as I left the cinema at Welbuat. I had to get even, and that evening I joined the Front Tireur et Partisans. I was soon involved in weapon drops, sabotage, attacking convoys and individual soldiers. One night, during a reconnaissance mission, I ended up face to face with the enemy and had just enough time to take shelter in a house. Using this submachine gun, I killed my first assailant and wounded another. It was only when I killed their officer that they retreated. As we were going forward, sometimes we'd pass the main enemy and somebody would be left behind, not knowing that they were retreating. This one time we came to a place 
where they were in like a little camp, and then they found out they had to surrender, and they all come out with their hands up and uh, with their equipment off, so they had to keep their hands out. And I was lucky to be near one of the captains who had the gun, I took it off of him. And uh, I wore it for a while, and they gave me help because if I was caught by a German, I'd be the first one that a gun would shoot. Then, uh, then I put it away and I didn't open it up until I got home. Sort of proud of it, I hate to say how I got it from war, but I never, I used it a little bit over in combat, but I never used it at home because they don't like have shells or use the gun. So I have it for a good souvenir. The battle for Brest and the surrounding area was very intense and destructive. After constant bombardment, the Allies forced the Germans into an even tighter pocket. On September 7th, Battery B fired 50 rounds at the coastal fort Graf Spee, scoring 30 hits. When the fire was lifted, Rangers moved in and captured the fort. 100 prisoners were taken. With the German army starting to surrender in mass, the Allies were looking forward for the Battle of Brest to end. On September 12th, General Troy Middleton sent a letter to General Romke offering him an opportunity to stop the bloodshed. He also sent flyers to the German troops calling for surrender. Romke, still following Hitler's orders of fight to the last man, replied simply, I must decline your proposal. Unhappy with Romke's response, General Middleton directed his men to take the Germans apart. On September 19th, the battle for Brest ended. Although not well known, Brest was one of the most bitterly fought battles of World War II. The Allies suffered 10,000 casualties. Although German losses are unknown, over 38,000 were captured. When U.S. Brigadier General Charles Canem arrived to accept General Romke's surrender, Romke asked the lower ranking man's credentials. Canem pointed to his nearby troops and said, these are my credentials. The capture of Brest gave the Allies a totally destroyed city. The Germans wrecked everything that might have been of any use. Bombs and shells by the Americans, many from the 557th Field Artillery, had burned and gutted practically every building in the city. Corporal Harvey Chapdelaine on the battle for Brest. It was worse to me than the bulge was. We lost more men at Brest than we did at the Battle of the Bulge. The one thing I'll never forget is the Germans never picked up their dead. We picked up as many as we could when we weren't under fire. The smell was awful. It gets in your nose. You never get rid of it. After the battle for Brest ended, my father and the men of the 557th Field Artillery had time for rest and recreation. In France, we went to uh, Mont Saint Michel. It's a small island off the coast, about a mile off, and there's a monastery on there. It's it's like uh, 600 feet high. It's just the diameter is only like 3,000 feet round, but it was quite interesting. And I asked the Colonel. I and a friend of mine would go and visit. They said, no, you stay where you belong. So we, our buddy and I said, they'll never find out we left. So we went. And we beautiful place. And we, you couldn't believe the way it was built that long ago. And we were going up a set of stairways. But who was coming down with my colonel? Michael, I told you you couldn't come here. He said, I want to see you more. Camped outside of Rennes, France, on October 23rd, the now battle-tested 557th Field Artillery received orders to move. Their destination, Nazi Germany. As the battalion convoyed across France, they passed through the outskirts of Paris, where the men saw the Eiffel Tower in the distance. 
As they continued their march through France, one day a heavy fog fell upon the area. Not knowing they were Americans, an Allied fighter came down out of the clouds, strafing the column, just narrowly missing Harvey Chapdelaine. You could hear the planes above, but you couldn't see them. That scared me. I thought of my ma. That's the first thing you think of when something like that happens. Passing through picturesque Belgium and seeing the windmills of Holland, on October 30th, 1944, the 557th Field Artillery reached Germany. My father, writing to my mother about life in Herbach, Germany. This used to be a German camp before we took it. The damage was done by the U.S. Army before we got there. It was a good camp at one time. The Germans took care of their soldiers when they could. We stayed around these barracks during the day, but at night we had to stay in our foxholes, as the Germans did most of their shelling and bombing then. At night the German plane would come and uh, drop uh, on a parachute a flare, and it would light up the place like daylight, and then if there was any movement they'd drop uh, personnel bombs. This camp was on top of a hill and the Germans knew we were occupying it. Several boys got Purple Hearts here. The fellows on the guns, they dug holes in the ground and built rooms down there so they could sleep in them. Well, we used to dig our own foxhole since we knew we were going to be there a while. We'd dig pretty big holes down about three feet, and we'd get the wood from the burned up or torn up cabins that the Germans had. My father, in a letter to my mother in November of 1944. This is my first foxhole in Germany. I lived in it for two weeks. I worked two days on this hole. It was about four feet deep and ten feet long. It was lined with wood and had eight inches of straw for a mattress. The best part was it did not leak, not even when it rained. I thought I had a castle. It made you feel good to be in it when we were shelled or bombed by the Germans. My father, in a letter to my mother, Dated November 16th, 1944. My darling Vi, I hope I can finish this letter before I have to go somewhere. This is the third time I started to write. I've been rather busy during the day, but at night when I do have time, I can't write because they can't have a light on at night. If you don't hear from me as often as you used to, honey, do not worry. I will be okay. The Germans sure caught hell today, and I hope every day from now until they decide to quit. There was a sky full of planes bombing them, and we were giving them hell with our guns too. I hope I never have to go through what they're going through. I saw some civilians looking up at the planes and shaking their heads and muttering something. I'll bet they said, Hitler never told us this. Okay, saddle up. We're moving out. Right. We just got here, Sarge. Oh, Sarge, I just washed. You said rest and recreation were coming up. Yeah, well, I talk too much. On a daily basis, the firepower of the 557th Field Artillery would be called upon to knock out any enemy resistance. More combat again, which almost repeat the same thing over and over. Harvey Chapdelaine. Mostly churches took a beating because they were observation posts. Anywhere there was resistance, we'd shell the hell out of them. My father on casualties and the men that replaced them. And they'll uh, take a lose a person. I think we lost 20 or 25 people all together. Some were scared and some found out it wasn't as bad as the infantrymen. So we got along pretty good. On December 11th, personnel of Battery B sought the protection of their foxholes when two heavy caliber shells of high explosives and a round of smoke dropped into the vicinity of their kitchen area and the nearby number one gun. There were no injuries or casualties reported. And I went with the captain. It was a while, 
And to me, it seems though we were going backwards. He says, who's running this place, me or you? Keep going. We come to a spot, set the tank up, and fire a couple of shots to the airplane to, to tell us where it had landed. But the Navy couldn't see where the shells were landing, but he was fighting towards the wrong area and almost hit where our camp was. And finally he found out, and <laughs> we had to turn around and go back, and he was telling me, Mike, I'm going to be in trouble. And I said to myself, I didn't like him. I said, I hope the heck they get rid of you. <laughs> but this is how my father and the men of the 557th Field Artillery celebrated Christmas Day, 1944. On, on Christmas Day, we were in an area where we were near the enemy, and then we found out that the enemy had more or less surrounded us. It was the last big effort they made, and it was foggy at that time, and we were ready to have a great meal for Christmas, and we didn't have a chance to eat. We guarded what we could and went forward to help the infantrymen. On Christmas Day, we had just had uh, chow time and we had orders to move. I remember driving down the road e eating on a drumstick of a turkey. <laughs> <laughs> on New Year's morning, 1945, the Luftwaffe, under the command of Hermann Goring, sent nearly 1,000 planes in the sky to attack 16 Allied airfields in Western Europe. A Luftwaffe combat wing on its way to its target flew smack into the teeth of the 557th Field Artillery who were camped just outside of Eldenhoven, Germany. My father, nearly 60 years later. The German plane was over us and they were shooting at us and we shot them back and we, we hit him and he came down and was winter and he crashed and he made a hole about six feet deep. That's how hard he was coming down. After the attack was over, my father was ordered to check on the pilot of one of the enemy fighters they shot down. He took a photo of the down plane and along with the letter, mailed it back home to my mother. This is one of the planes I told you we knocked down on New Year's Day. Not much left of it, is there, honey? The ground was frozen solid, but the Heine plane still made quite the hole in it. The pilot is still in the ground. He was burned to dust. Did I feel sorry? I did not. The Allied soldiers who fought in that New Year's morning attack across Western Europe nicknamed it the Hangover Raid. The Battle of the Bulge was the last major offensive by the Germans during the war. The 557 field artillery duties during the bulge were to provide support wherever the infantry needed it. I did very little gun shooting at the Battle of Bulge. It was shell after shell after shell. We shelled the living hell out of them. They were sending paratroopers at night in American uniforms. You had to be damn careful. We finally beat them. They had to return. go back again. And then from there and then, they didn't have a chance to do anything with us. I only have his letters and I only have uh, what my father told me. Uh, my father was Vic's younger brother. My uncle was always somebody that I looked up to. That um, He served in the war. He volunteered uh, to fight, even though that he didn't have to. And he saw quite a bit of battle and action. So I always looked up to my uncle. He was a, he was a hero to me, and is today. After spending much time in the combat zone, my father received a pass to go to Paris. I don't remember much about Paris, but I remember it was a beautiful town. I saw the Eiffel Tower and 
the Arc de Triomphe. I had two different leaves there. I also saw the most beautiful church. It was a Notre Dame Cathedral. My father returned to the combat zone and the reality and the frustrations of war that went with it. My father, in a letter to my mother, this picture was taken in Germany soon after I got back from Paris. I was aiming at some German prisoners in a stockade. I sure would have liked to have pulled the trigger. We listened to Axis Sally on the radio. What's Axis Sally? Oh, she spread propaganda and told the troops to give up, that the Germans are winning. And Is that right? Oh, I yeah. never heard of Axis Sally. Yeah. So she was like the Tokyo Rose of Europe? That's right. On February 26, 1945, my father's 29th birthday, the 557th Field Artillery crossed the Rohr River in Lenach, Germany. Due to the strategic position of the bridge and the heavy concentration of troops in the area, the 557th was constantly under fire from enemy fighters. It was probably Adolf Hitler's way of saying, Happy Birthday to my father. One day, Corporal Harvey Chapdelaine of Northboro, Massachusetts was next to a large wall. His curiosity got the best of him, and he decided to investigate what was on the other side. After creeping around the side with his gun drawn, Chapdelaine came face to face with a gun held by another resident of Northboro, Massachusetts. Harvey Chapdelaine. Thank God we didn't pull the trigger. There are one or two million soldiers over there, and to have one from your hometown and meet him like that was incredible. My father, in a letter to my mother and sister just after Valentine's Day, notice the censor stamp in the left corner. Dear Jeannie, I was happy and proud to receive your cute little Valentine. I am happy to know you thought of your daddy, even though he is so far away. I was happy to see the word dad on the valentine. I remember how sweet you used to say daddy when I was home on furlough. Remember honey? I hope I will be home to play with you before long. Mommy tells me in her letters that you are a good girl and that you listen to her all the time. I'm glad you do honey. Tell mommy to take some pictures of you and send them to me. Bye Jeannie. Be a nice girl. Give mommy a big kiss for me. I love you both so much. Love and kisses, Daddy. There was a time when our gunning crew were creeping up on an enemy position. Creeping as much as you can with an engine and tank treads making a huge racket. Anyway, the German position wasn't where we thought. It was about a hundred yards away. They saw us first and started to fire on our gun and crew. The lieutenant yelled, save the gun, and promptly dove for cover. I jumped up on our tank and started cranking down the gun, and Max started it up and drove it away. We did this while we were under fire. Darned if the army didn't award that lieutenant the bronze star for saving the gun. So tell me about your food. What did you eat? Oh, I don't remember particularly, but I know one time we butchered a calf, and then at the farm they slaughtered a bunch of geese and the cook, cooked up the geese. And another time we were deer hunting, we had venison stew. Oh, you did? <laughs> and we had a fire and a drum going, and in that particular area there were chestnut trees, so we were able to roast chestnuts and have those for a snack. Wow, that's quite a treat. <laughs> it was different. That is quite a treat. Yeah. My father talking about naming his Jeep. After I uh, got the Jeep, we were allowed to put a, a name on the Jeep. And I put my daughter's name on, Jean Marie. 
Instead of letters, sometimes my father would just write on the back of pictures he took. This is the man you married, honey. You must have been blind or wanted to get married pretty bad. Do you like it? Married life, I mean. Of course, there was always time for humor. This little pig was our mascot for our second birthday celebration. The one with the 557 on it is the pig, honey. On the days the Battery A weren't involved in firing missions, they would do maintenance on their guns. Private First Class Casmer Pesta on what happened on one of those days. One day, we were doing maintenance on our gun when a dogfight broke out in the sky above us. I put my oil can down on the ground right next to me and watched the fight. When it was over, I picked up the can to continue doing maintenance on the gun, and I noticed that one of the planes in the dogfight had shot a hole right through it. The next morning we started out, some German planes were going over, were shooting at us. On April 16, 1945, the 557th Field Artillery was headed towards Cloetze, Germany, when from out of the sky came six enemy fighters. That was in uh, April, and we were advancing, and the uh, Germans strafed our column. Well, we were near a woods. We all jumped out of our tanks and ran into the woods. But this one kid, young guy, quiet, loaned everybody money, he never got it back. He jumped out, he was on the, where the, all the shells were, and he jumped out and he got stuck on the tank. As the men jumped off their guns and scrambled for cover, flame and black smoke burst from a Baker battery ammunition carrier. In just minutes, exploding ammunition completely demolished the carrier. All had escaped but two, Private First Class Liel Mackey and Private First Class Colin Marshall. The driver of the carrier, Tech 5 Arthur Munden, with disregard for his own personal safety, tried to save Mackey and Marshall from further harm. It was to no avail. Both Mackey and Marshall perished from the enemy fighter attack. And there we were, in the woods looking, we couldn't do anything about going to save him and saw him burned to death. And that kept us sad for a long time. My father, in a letter written to my mother on May 1st, 1945, from Lash, Germany. I make a good fisherman or gondolier, don't I? About 30 of us entered this town and captured about 40 prisoners. We sent the prisoners back and chased all the civilians out. We would find places where somebody dug in and uh, buried stuff. So we dug up this one time and uh, we found a big case, big case of whiskey. So we took it. We were going to have a ball with it, but the captain found out and he took it off from us. So during the night, some of us guards went over and stole it back. He didn't know who they had got it. We said we didn't know. We don't know anything about it. We found a lot of whiskey the Germans buried, and I had the worst drunk of my life. Ever since that drunk, I cannot stand the smell of whiskey. This was our last firing position. This town is about three miles from the Elbe River. The Germans were coming to the river and surrendering by the thousands. They were afraid of the Russians. When we got to the Elbe River, the Russians were on the other side. And uh, the German people were fleeing the Russians, they came through and were heading to the west. Even though they lived in that, that eastern part, they wanted to get out, out of the control of the G Russians. The Russians, oh my yeah. goodness, and you saw that? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And we could see those poor German people.
running away from the combat area. And some had little carts they were pushing. And one time, which was strange, one of the wheels fell off from one of the group, and one guy was holding that, wheel, uh, that part of the buggy up. And when the other three wheels were working, and uh, instead of laughing things, we felt sorry for them. Because it wasn't their fault that they were in the trouble they were. But that's something they had to do was get killed from the shells we were shooting. And a lot of times when the Germans sh shot, sometimes they missed us but hit some of them. Doing well, and I got another furrow to go to Paris. And on the way home, um, back to camp from Paris, I ran into Belgium on a train. And I saw people outside dancing and screaming and yelling and hugging each other. The Germans surrendered. And then I got to camp and everybody was there having a good time and drinking and all of that. Harvey Chapdelaine was in Paris when the war ended. You never saw such celebrations in your life. I spent three days in Paris sipping white wines and joining parades across the country. I'll never forget that. And what were you doing on VE Day? I had just come back from a pass somewhere. somewhere. <laughs> Did you? This one time the war was over, maybe a week or two, and here comes a German soldier in German uniform. And it was in a small town, and uh, we stopped him. And uh, he says he wanted to see his family. His family is only two blocks away, but the officer is no way. He's a prisoner right now, and, but uh, we did it maybe on a sneak or whatever. We went and got the family and brought them to him. And they talked and kissed each other and all of that. Then he had to go back as a prisoner. And we thought we did a pretty good thing there because it was wars over and it wasn't kid fault and, and uh, we're happy we, we did that though. But when the war ended we were all happy it was over and usually we just hang around a while and I was happy because I thought I'd be able to go to Italy to see my forefathers. We talked about it then about two or three weeks later when I said I wanted to go to Italy, she said, you're not going to Italy, you're going home. I said, well, that just is good. We were going home, get ready to go to Japan. This is the boat that welcomed us home from overseas. We came on the liner Mariposa. Well, is there anything you'd like to add to this interview that I didn't ask? Well, the title of this story is the longest, my longest year. I sailed from Brooklyn on July 2nd. Right. And a year later, July 7th, I left from Cherbourg, France, to Boston. That was a so. long year. Within two weeks or so, I'm visiting, going to visit my mother in an Indian Indiana Road. I stopped for red light, and over the radio, there's a report that Japanese people had surrendered. And we went up to see my mother and explained everything. And our first story was that we had to go to Japan within two months to attack and invade Japan. And we, well, the paper said we'd lose over 500,000 people, but they even had 10 year olds who got But thank God some people disagree with it. We dropped atomic bombs and it wiped whole cities out with atomic bombs and the Japanese surrendered. Up to this day, some people said we should have done that. But Japanese, the people that said we should have done that, didn't realize that we were going to have so many people killed. With the war now over, my father went to Camp Cook, California to be discharged. Finally got my pack, my papers, be discharged, and I went back home. And that was the end of my service. But in the meantime, while I was in, the, in combat area where all the noise was, my hearing was bad. So, before I got discharged, they checked me. And uh, they put me in a cubby hole. We were only even two feet apart, and he started talking. He said, now you listen to me and repeat. 
and he was practically yelling. I could hear him. And then he says, well, your hearing is okay. It hasn't been good since.